going to be in Revelation today, obviously. Uh, we've been marching through Revelation, and we're going to be in chapter 14. Um, so you can put your finger there, but as, as you turn there, I want to read a passage to you in John chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus is talking to the multitude after he's fed 5,000, and they've chased him around because they want some more food. And he says, <laughs> he said, you don't believe in me, even though you've seen. However, those the Father has given me, and this is um, John 6, verse 37. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do what I want. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all of those who he has given me but that I should raise them up to eternal life at the last day. For this is my Father's will, that all those who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life, and that I should raise them up on the last day. Our salvation is secure in Jesus, because it's the will of the Father. It's the will of the Father that Jesus not lose any, and Jesus won't lose any. And the reason why I reference that right away is because in chapter 14, he talks about the 144,000 Jews that have been marked and have gone through the tribulation period. Enoch walked with God, and God took him straight to heaven. He delivered him out of the turmoil that was to come on the ark. The day, the year, that Enoch was not with us anymore and went straight to heaven was the exact same time that the flood happened. So he took Noah through the flood. Through, he took Enoch out. He takes his church out. He brings these people through. So we're going to see that the redemption of the world is what Revelation is about. Um, you have to think for a minute that 2,000 years ago, God deliberately and meticulously laid out how the end of the world was going to be. Seven seals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seventh one opens, that opens up seven trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh trumpet sounds, that opens up seven vials. Do you see how precise God is in all this? This isn't God blowing his top. This isn't God going, that's it, I'm done. Let's get him. That's kind of how we do things. And that's kind of how we feel about things. But that is not our Savior. That is not our Lord. He was not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So he's been very patient. Sometimes I'm like, come on. Let's do this thing. But if he'd have done this thing a while back, I wouldn't be on the right side of the coin. You know what I mean? Some of you all wouldn't be there. Because God is patient. And when he goes through Revelation, he goes to all, through all these steps, it is so he can extract the exact most he can out of humanity. Sin has wrecked havoc on humanity. And sin will be judged. But it's not going to be one little bit more than it has to be. It is the most merciful judgment that you've ever seen. It's the most metered thing you've ever seen. God uses precision. I like to confront problems and get them solved. And I would call myself a butcher in that respect. And I butchered a deer a couple days ago, and if you saw me butcher a deer, you'd be like, that guy gets after it. If I gut a deer, it's like a minute. It takes me about a minute or two. It's like, whoa, that's kind of harsh. God is a surgeon. When you want somebody working on people, you want a surgeon, not a butcher. And so a lot of times our mentality is a butcher's mentality. Get it done. Get it over with. Who cares if there's some scrap or waste? Let's go. God's like every little bit. He's very precise. Um, this book, Revelation, is a blessing to us, not a burden. I have to remind myself that when I'm studying. Because sometimes I'm like, whoa, this is heavy. God goes, it's justice, and it's good. I want you to know that we go through about three chapters a time, and I know that's a little fast. It's like 
It's like Revelation at 10,000 feet. Because if we did it like half a chapter a week, we'd be in Revelation for about a year. I don't want to be in Revelation for a year, so maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm being selfish. But I think that if it's about redemption, let's talk about the redemption, but let's not get stuck on the things that we won't even be here for. Let's not get stuck on the wrath of God. Um, we remembered last week that every tear that we have ever shed, God has in a bottle somewhere. He knows our troubles. He knows our sorrows. He cares, and he's going to redeem it all. And that's what this is about. So just remember that this is a redemption story. In chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Then I saw the Lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a great waterfall or the rolling of mighty thunder. It was like the sound of many harpists playing together. This great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God and before the four living beings and the 24 elders. And no one could learn this song except those 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. We saw that the church and the four uh, creatures were singing a song. They sang a new song. It was a song of redemption. There's only a few creatures in the, in the whole universe that can sing a song of redemption. That's human beings. And then these 144,000. That they've been redeemed out of the world. They've been picked out. It says, for they, for they are spiritually undefiled, pure as virgins, following the Lamb wherever he goes. They've been purchased from among the people on, on the earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb. No falsehood can be charged against them, for they are blameless. Now this is interesting, because you get to say, who could be blameless? Who could, you know, like nobody charge anything against them? And it reminded me immediately of one of my favorite passages in Ephesians, is that that's who, that's who you and I are. The reason why that they can claim this thing and sing this song and be these spotless people is because of Christ alone, because of redemption. That's who you are. We forget that so often. And I forget it so often that when I get a chance to go back and read it, I'm going to read it. So here's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, How we praise God. Now the theme of this passage is praise. It's, it's what Christians do. We praise and worship and extol our Savior. And why do we do that? Because we look in the mirror and realize what we are in reality. And then we see who God sees us. Who are you in Christ Jesus? That's what matters. It's easy to get down on yourself. It's easy to look at yourself logically. It's easy to look at other people logically. But who are they in Christ Jesus? Do you look at other people with the lens of grace? Or do you look at people with the lens of judgment and rationality? Christians are people of grace. In chapter 1, verse 3 of Ephesians, it says, How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we belong to Christ. Long ago, even before he made the world. Now, you can see how this ties into Revelation. Even before he made the world, it said, it says, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Do you know that's how you look to Jesus? That's how you look to the Father? If you're in Christ, you're perfect. If you're in Christ, you're perfect. You're spotless in his eyes. And the great example that the Bible gives us is when a guy was guilty and he went to the temple, he would carry a lamb. And this lamb, if, if you were carrying a lamb under your arm to the temple, guess what everybody knew? You're a sinner. You're, you're, you're bad. You need redemption. And when you got there, the priest didn't go, let me take a look at you. What did you do? You know who he looked at? The lamb. 
And he had to make sure the lamb was spotless. And the lamb was perfect. And the lamb was worthy of sacrifice. And then he would sacrifice that lamb for you so that you would be redeemed. That picture we should never lose in our minds of who we are in Christ Jesus. The question about you is, are you in Jesus? Not how good are you. I know who I am. That gives me a good idea who you are. And that's no great shakes. <laughs> Sometimes people say, well, if you knew your congregation, you might not want to be their pastor. And I'm like, well, if you knew your pastor, you might not want to be my congregation. <laughs> We're all in the same boat. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after him. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And God laid his, our iniquity on him. So the answer is Jesus Christ. So when it talks about us being perfect in his eyes, that's how God sees us. And are you going to believe what God, how God sees you or are you going to take the way you see you? Are you going to accept what God says about his children? Or are you going to believe your eyes and your ears and your nose? Hmm. Because of this, in verse 6 it says, So we praise God for his wonderful kindness he's poured out on us because we belong to his dearly loved son. If you skip down to verse 12, it says, God's purpose was that we who were first to trust in Christ should praise our glorious God. Then in verse 14, the last sentence says, this is just one more reason for us to praise our glorious God. We praise God as a response for what he's done for us. And that's these 144,000. This is the four, the 24 elders. This is the four creatures. This is the great multitude. This is the tribulation saints. We're all before the throne of God going, oh, Lord, my God. Wow. We know what we are, and we see what you are. We see who we are in you, and we're clothed in his righteousness. So in verse 6 it says, And I saw another angel flying through the heavens, carrying the everlasting good news to preach to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him. For the time has come when he will sit as judge. Worship him who has made the earth and the sea, and all the springs of the water. Now it says that this angel is carrying this, the salvation message to the whole earth. Some people believe that what we need to do is take all the gospel to all the nations, and once the gospel gets to all the nations, then Jesus can come back. I want you to know that the Apostle Paul in four different places said that the, no, that the world had been reached with the gospel in his lifetime. Without television, can you believe that? Without the internet, can you believe that? How do you think the whole world gets reached in one apostle's lifetime without media? People. People sharing with people, sharing with people. Changed lives. The miraculous power of a changed life. We don't need methods. We don't need the world's methods to spread the gospel. You know what we need? Christians who praise the Lord. Christians who are like, thank God, I know who I am and I know what he's done for me. It makes you gracious. It makes you kind. It makes you full of life. But if you start thinking about all the do's and all the don'ts, what does that make you? Mm, I don't know. Let's say a pinhead. <laughs> Let's just say it's small. Let's just say I measure up and you don't. But it's a, all a pride trip. It's all a control method. You know what? That's what people think about the church. The church is here to control people. No, no, no. The church is here to build people up in the faith. The church is here to encourage people. The church is a place where we can grow up together in safety, in love, in grace. Knowing that if we mess up, the grace of God is flowing through me and it's flowing through you. We can cut each other a break, right? If we remember to. Then another angel followed him through the sky shouting Babylon has fallen that great city has fallen because she seduced the nations of the world and made them drink the wine of her passionate immorality 
Then a third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast and his statue or accepts the mark on the forehead or the hand must drink the wine of God's wrath. You see what these angels are doing? They're proclaiming the gospel and they're warning. They're going through the sky warning people. God's given one last chance of warning, saying Babylon has fallen. And we're going to uh, discuss Babylon next week in depth. And Babylon, if you said there's the kingdom of God, look, what's the kingdom of God? And you define that. The, the life to come, everlasting principles, you know, the Beatitudes and the, the, the message that Jesus preached. Then if you went the world, the world's religion, the world's finances, the world's ethics, the world, the world, the world. That's Babylon, Babylon, Babylon. The religious Babylon is the religion that the world has. It's the man-made thing where we make steps to heaven. Christianity is the only, the only one where God reaches down to a fallen man and redeems him. You know, every other religion in the world is steps to be right with God or steps to become a God or steps, but you're making the steps. You're doing the thing. Christianity is like, <laughs> while you are yet a sinner, Christ died for you. He reaches down in his love and reaches you where you are. Now, he, he loves you the way you are. He loves you too much to leave you that way, so that's what growing up's about. You know, so that's growing. You can still grow. You don't have to keep all your horrible traits, you know, <laughs> because and it's and God God sees you as perfect. So it's like, oh, I see you as you're perfect. I always compare that to my wife and our grandchildren. You know, I'm like, boy, they certainly are misbehaving. Oh, they're fine. <laughs> they're great. Aren't they wonderful? Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> She sees them through that lens, you know, of grace. Oh, they're having a tough day. They got a good heart. They're wonderful. I'm like, what? She's more godly than I am. I'm more carnal in my vision. But it talks about even warning people off this mark of the beast. And I want you to know, there's a lot of a lot of talk that goes around. What's the mark of the beast? Well, it says right here in. Verse 11 says, The smoke of their torment rises forever, ever, forever and ever. They will have no relief day or night. For they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. I want you to know the mark of the beast doesn't sneak up on you. That's what we can see from here. This is like an obvious decision these people are making. And there's an obvious warning. Don't do this. And this is in the tribulation period. So we can see, obviously, precursors to this mark, can't we? But like I said last week, people said, Social Security numbers, mark of the beast. UPC codes, mark of the beast. D different things Christians will pick up on, and they'll see the precursors, and they're like, oh, I know what that is. And we do, because the Bible tells us, right? But you don't want to run around screaming, mark of the beast. You want to run around saying, Jesus is Lord. You want to walk around saying, God loves you. God can forgive. You can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Not mark of the beast, mark of the beast, mark of the beast. Antichrist, Antichrist, Antichrist. New world order, one world system, you know. These things are things we all know and can see them in place because the Bible told us what was going to happen. So there's no panic in our eyes. There's no, we're like, yep. It's coming down, just like God said. You better get ready. I, you know, you liken it to the Titanic. The Titanic hit an iceberg and got ripped all the way down the side. So, we as Christians go, well, she's going down. There's a lifeboat right there. Let's get in. Now, if you run around screaming at everybody, they might think you're a nut, and then they won't get the knife in the lifeboat, right? So, part of the Christian balance is to be the kind of person that people listen to. Be the kind of people that people are like, hmm, I should listen to that guy. Be a witness with your life. Don't just witness. Be a witness. Be the kind of people that like, 
when the stuff is all happening, people look and go, who's a stable person around here? Who's a person who's got sense? I'm going to go ask them. I'm going to go talk to them. So if you thought of yourself on a Titanic that was going down, what would be your strategies to get people on a lifeboat? That's kind of how we are in America, in the, in the nation, in the world, is we can see it's been hit and ripped down the side, right? We can identify the problem and go. And we can all sit around going, guys should have been listening, they were too cocky, you know, somebody fell asleep, that darn iceberg, global warming. Uh, you can just get mad at stuff and point fingers and blame. We can go, ship's going down. Let's get on the lifeboats, folks. You have to be that kind of credible witness. So it says, let this encourage God's holy people to endure persecution patiently and remain firm to the end, obeying his commands and trusting in Jesus. These are the tribulation saints, because like I said before, was this two witnesses in the temple and 144,000 witnessing? There are going to be a multitude, an innumerable amount of tribulation saints people being saved saved and martyred not the 144,000 they're sealed through but the other people will be killed for their faith because they won't take the mark and I heard a voice from heaven saying write this down blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on yes says the spirit they are blessed indeed for they will rest from all their toils and their trials and their good deeds follow them so saying those who are faithful in the tribulation period will die for their faith. And good for them, it's saying. It would be better to die in that world than to live in that world, if you know what I mean. It says, Then I saw the Son of Man sitting on a white cloud. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. This is the Son of Man with a harvesting instrument, and it's very sharp. It's for a specific thing, and it's very precise. Now, when you think of harvesting, there's a difference between harvesting a field and burning a field, isn't there? What's harvesting a field for? To take the good out and to leave the bad behind. Burning a field is like, it's all getting eaten up. It's all getting burned up. This idea of a sickle being sharp is God is using a precise way to harvest the world. To harvest the remaining. It says, Then an angel came from the temple and called out in a loud voice to one sitting on the cloud, Use the sickle, for the time has come for you to harvest. The crop is ripe on earth. So it's ready. All these different things that have happened have prepared the world for this moment. So the one sitting on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the whole earth was harvested. After that, another angel came from the temple in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, who has the power to destroy the world with fire, shouted to the angel with the sickle, Use your sickle to now gather the clusters of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are fully ripe for judgment. So the angel swung his sickle on the earth and loaded the grapes into the great winepress of God's wrath. And the grass were trodden, and the grapes were trodden in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press in a stream about 180 miles long and as high as a horse's bridle. So this is the final harvest. He's separating the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats, the tares from the wheat. I want to read you something in Matthew chapter 13. You can turn there if you want to. It's Matthew 13, 24 through 29. And that's, this is where Jesus tells a parable. And then in verse 26 to 43, he actually translates the parable so that they'll understand it perfectly. And I think this is a very important point. I want to um, expand on this because many people inside the church for many years have tried to figure out who's genuine and who's not. Are you familiar with the idea of, like, there are people who are possessors? And then there's professors. Like some people claim they're Christians and they're not. Right? Because in the end times it says some people say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? 
Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do miracles in your name? You know, and, and he says, depart from me, because I never knew you. Now, I've heard people camp on that, and they try to, like, figure out who is or isn't, or put people under a microscope and make them doubt who they are. And I want to tell you that the Bible says that's dangerous. And that's wrong. Now, if you walked up to a kid, 10, 12 years old, and said, do you think you're really, like, your mom and dad are really your mom and dad? Do you think you're a genuine child? What do you think the parents would think if they caught you doing that? Holy smokes. You get, you get pounded. So it makes me infuriated when I hear pastors or teachers go, do you think y'all are really saved? you think Jesus is really, you know, you're just not manifesting the way you should. You know, you should really w wonder about that. My brother and I used to call that shaken baby syndrome. It's like you walk up to a Christian, you're like, Ugh. it's wrong. And this is why it's wrong. In chapter 13, verse 24, it says, Here is another story that Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as everyone slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's servants came and told him, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. An enemy has done it, the farmer exclaimed. Shall we pull out the weeds? They asked. He replied, no, you'll hurt the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the wheat and burn them and put the wheat in the barn. So like, that seems pretty obvious, but we want to make sure that we understand it. In verse 36, it says, Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, Please explain the story of the weeds in the field. All right, he said, I, the son of man, am the farmer who planted the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are separated out of the, out of the, and burned, so it will be at the end of the world. I, the Son of Man, will send my angels, and they will remove from my kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And they will throw them in the furnace and burn them. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the godly will shine like the sun. In the Father's kingdom, anyone who is willing to hear should listen and understand. Is that as obvious as can be? We're not to go around trying to pull out weeds. We're to fertilize and cultivate and do what we can do. And who's going to sort this out? God will at the end of the age. Do you know what it's like when you, well, it's just blasphemy to take God off of his throat and say, I got this one. That person's probably not saved. Do you know how damaging that is to somebody? you know how hurtful that is? I've known people who have spun out for decades because of that. And I could say it's well-meaning, but it's anti-biblical, isn't it? It's completely against what Jesus said. Jesus said, I planted the good seed. The devil plants bad seed, and they're all mixed together like this. And you're not to get in there and try to pull them apart. You just let God do it. So this is what he's doing in this harvest. He's harvesting the wheat from the chaff. He's harvesting the grapes from the dross. He's harvesting, and he's doing it with a sickle and a sickle sharp. It's precise. It's not sloppy. It's not haphazard. It's not a Jesus in a rage. Chapter 15 says, Then I saw 
in heaven another significant event, and this was a great and marvelous. Seven angels were holding the seven last plagues, which would bring God's wrath to completion. That is a relief to hear that, isn't it? <laughs> it's going to bring it to a completion. I saw before me what seemed like a crystal sea mixed with fire, and on it stood the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the numbers representing his name. And they were all holding harps. Now, the holding harps part can give you a clue that they're not alive anymore. <laughs> so they were victorious over the beast by dying a martyr's death that God had given them. And they were sitting and they were singing the song of Moses, which is a song of deliverance, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, which is a song of redemption. So they have deliverance and redemption. Great and marvelous are your actions, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O God, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, and your righteous deeds have been revealed. Wow. These are the seven angels. Now, it says in some places in your Bibles, it'll say bowls. Other places will say vials. Bowls means like mixing bowls, like precise things mixed in a bowl. A vial, if you think of a vial, that's a more accurate representation to me. Because when you think of a vial, you think of something medicinal that's been mixed for a specific purpose. And that's what these seven things are. These seven vials are God has specifically decided what to lay down one step at a time to end this thing and to get ready for the millennial reign of Christ. Because this is all for a purpose. He's going to lay this thing out, and he's going to just topple everything, and then he's going to do it right. We'll have a thousand years of perfection here on earth. But until then, he has to use this procedure. He's using this procedure because it is absolutely, it's a righteous restraint that he's using. It says, then I looked and saw that the temple in heaven, God's tabernacle, was thrown wide open. What happened before this? They're all praising God. When they're praising God and saying who God is, the temple's thrown open. In your life, if it feels like it's all shut, have you ever prayed and it felt like it was just bouncing off the ceiling? You're like, this seems weird. It doesn't even seem real. I'm praying, but it doesn't seem like I'm praying. Praise the Lord. Put on some worship music. Worship him and the temple will be wide open. Now, this temple is wide open, but it's also wide open for judgment. These angels come out at this point. It says the seven angels who are holding the bowls of the seven plagues came from the temple clothed in spotless white linen with gold belts across their chest. These gold belts symbolize perfection and restraint. So it's perfection, restraint, righteous, and what they're holding in their hands is these vials, which is judgment. Like Again, I just have to keep saying, this is not God boiling over. This is God 2,000 years ago predicting exactly what's going to happen at the end of the age in a precise way for a precise reason. In one of the four living beings handed each of the seven angels a bowl filled with the terrible wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke, from God's glory and power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven angels had completed pouring out the seven plagues. So while this judgment is going on, the temple is not to be entered. It says, Then I heard a mighty voice in chapter 16, verse 1, shouting from the temple to the seven angels, Now go your ways and empty out the seven bowls of God's wrath on earth. So the first angel left the temple and poured out his bowl over the earth. And horrible, malignant sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped the statue. This could well be a side effect to the mark of the beast. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and everything in the sea died. And the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs, and they became blood. So we'd seen earlier judgments where one-third of the earth was polluted. This is the whole earth being polluted. 
And I heard the angel who had authority over all water saying, You are just in sending this judgment, O holy one, who is and who always was. For your holy people and your prophets have been killed, and their blood was poured out on this earth. So you have given their murderers blood to drink. It was their just reward. And I heard a voice from the altar saying, Yes, Lord, God Almighty, your punishments are true and just. This is a justice for the martyrs of the world, the innocents that have been killed. As you pray for the innocent blood that's been shed, this is that coming true in the end. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. Everyone was burned by the blast of the heat, and they cursed the name of God who sent all of these plagues. They did not repent or give him glory. So you have four. Four of these things happen. All of the water, all of the land, the earth is scorching down, and it says, did they repent? No. They cursed the name of God. Now I want you to know that this is proving who they are. This is not making them who they are. This is proving out who they are. They've taken the mark of the beast. They have pledged allegiance to the beast and the image of his name and the dragon behind it all. So when these things happen, they're showing their true character. God is revealing that the judgment is just against them. It says, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and the kingdom was plunged into darkness, and his subjects ground their teeth in anguish, and they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, but they refused to repent of all their evil deeds. So they're just revealing what's in their hearts, right? God is using these precise things to show that his judgment is true against these who will not turn. It says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and it dried up so that the kings from the east coast could march their armies westward without hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So this, where it says, the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, this is like an unholy trinity at the end of the age that the dragon is behind giving power to the false prophet who is giving a life to the beast. And people are worshiping this beast and saying the Euphrates River dries up so that the armies from, say, India, China, that whole continent can come across, which is over 200 million, an army that big. Because they're all going to meet in Armageddon. And I I, I don't want to ruin it for you. You probably already know this, but in Armageddon, you have this place that every general that's ever seen it is like, this is a place for the war to end all wars. And they all come together, and they're in a fight. You know what unites them at the end? They look up and go, oh, let's fight God. (laughs) Yeah. That's the one thing that unites them at the end, because The sickle has been harvesting the people. The martyrs have been rolling just out of this tribulation period because they won't take the mark of the beast. The whole world is being turned over to the devil and the Babylonian system, the system of the world, its ethics, its morals, its religion, its politics, its everything else. It's all been turned over to them, and as they all get together to fight it all out, they all decide there's one thing they can unite on. Let's point our guns up. So you can see how this finale, this the finality to things are going. He's parsing out and parsing out and parsing out and parsing out. We finally get to the evil of evils. And as this seventh is is poured out, we see that okay. And what we're going to do next week, as a preview, is that it's going to talk about the Babylon's falling. Today it'll talk about Babylon being leveled, but it'll talk specifically about this Babylon, that Babylon, which is kind of the system of the world, the religion of the world. So we'll go into depth next week on that, but I just want you to kind of get this picture of God doing everything precise that he can do to bring us to the end and these people manifesting, we're never going to turn. 
we're never going to change. And those are the people who he ultimately judges. It says uh, in verse 14, these miracle working demons caused all the rulers of the world to gather for a battle against the Lord on the great judgment day of God Almighty. Do you see how these creatures are gathering these people to fight against God? They think they're gathering to fight against each other. Oftentimes when the devil tries to prompt people to fight each other, they're really just disobeying God. All sins ultimately are against God. We perpetrate them on our fellow man, but they're against God. Take note. Now this is like a little, just a little blurb in here. Take note. I will come unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are those who are watching for me, who keep their robes ready so they will not need to walk naked in the shame. Just like going, you don't have to go through any of this. This looks terrible. Hey, you can accept Christ now and forget all this. Not at that time, but I'm saying right now, currently. And they gathered all the rulers and their armies to a place called Armageddon in Hebrew. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a mighty shout came from the throne of the temple in heaven, saying, It is finished. So Jesus says it is finished on the cross. He's saying it is finished now. So this is the final judgment. Then the thunder crashed and rolled and lightning flashed and there was an earthquake greater than ever before in human history. The great city of Babylon split into three pieces and the cities around the world fell into heaps of rubble. And so God remembered all of Babylon's sins and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. So we see, it says all the great cities of the world fell. There's going to be such a cataclysmic earthquake that the islands will vanish, the mountains will fall, and all the cities of the world will be destroyed. It says, and every island disappeared, and all the mountains were leveled. There was a terrible hailstorm, and hailstones weighing 75 pounds like, fell from the sky on the people below. They cursed God because of the hailstorm, which was a very terrible plague. Do you know what the penalty for the sin of blasphemy is? Stoning. He is sending hailstorms on the people here at the end. This Armageddon, this this time where things come to a close. He's settling all things in an exacting, precise, merciful patient way. Do you see that in this? That it is exacting. It's precise. It's not haphazard. It's merciful and it's patient. Trying to get the most he can. The very most he can. It highlights the depths of people's like the people that he's judging here. Like we see these hailstones coming down. It says They cursed God because of the hailstorm. They're not changing, are they? It's showing that his his judgment is true on these who will not change. This was a very terrible plague. So next week is kind of a timeout. The timeout is to show when it says Babylon has fallen, Babylon is judged, Babylon, it's going to tell about Babylon in chapter 17 and 18, which we'll cover next week. If you want to read ahead, it's a very interesting read because some of these things are very specific. You say, wow, that's the financial system that we're in right now. It would be almost like, it's almost a precursor to 9-11. Or what would happen if a nuclear bomb went off on Wall Street and the whole world was like, wait a second, what are we going to do now? Who are we going to trade with? How are we going to get our stuff? How are we going to make money? You know, I saw a thing today, um, recently on Facebook. It was like the world's not starving for lack of for lack of resources. It's starving because some people choose to gather richness to themselves. Like, there's enough food to feed everybody in the world, isn't there? But there's no money in that, is there? I remember. I'll close with this. I remember sitting in the lobby of the jail one time. 
I was waiting to go in and do a Bible study, and there was a young man there. And uh, I said, you go to the Bible study? He says, nah. I said, well, he said, I just can't believe in a God. I don't want to find out about a God who lets people starve to death in this world. And I said, that's a very good, good observation. I said, but let me ask you something. Just real quick. I said, I'm not trying to argue with you. I don't want to fight with you. But we got time before I go in. I said, is there enough food to feed everybody in the world? He said, yeah, I reckon so. I said, yeah, we have like corn stoves, right? We burn corn in stoves to keep our houses warm. We turn it into ethanol to drive our cars down the road. So I think there's probably enough to feed everybody if we could do that with it, right? He's like, yeah. And I said, and there's enough planes to take it around the world, isn't there? He said, yeah. I said, enough boats, yeah. Enough people to pass it out? Yeah. I said, well, then it isn't really God letting people starve to death, is it? It's me and you. And he's, he's very he's a sharp guy. He says, what are you doing about it? <laughs> I said, whoa, that's good. I said, I actually, I said, I'm glad... I said, oh, I actually support kids from Compassion International and give my money. You know, it's like for $30 a month, you can give someone an education. You can feed them. I said, I'm not going to feed all the people in the world. But I always have to look at myself in the mirror and said, what if everyone acted like me? Would the world be fed? Would the world be clothed? Would the world be educated if people acted like me? I said, so, you know, it's something to think about. He went, so he was at the next Bible study, and I, I got, <laughs> got to know the guy. And it's like people ask real questions. And when you read Revelation, you can go, boy, that's some harsh mess. That's some tough stuff. But if you look at it from God's perspective of redemption, it's a beautiful picture of God's restraint and his precision. It's a beautiful picture of God being just, merciful and just and restrained. And patient, and it's a, it's a real charge to me to go. Is that me? Is that the way I react? Have I saturated myself enough in God's grace and God's love that that's what I'm broadcasting to the world, or am I just being like everybody else? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It is a challenge to us but it's also a blessing to us and a comfort to us. You make things very clear. We can mess them up in a hurry, but you make them clear. You love the world so much that you gave your only begotten son. And there's only one way we can be right with you. That's to accept the sacrifice that you gave each one for each one. You love us. You can't take your, your eyes off of us. I pray that that's the message that we would bring to the world. Not one of helter-skelter, not one of, of panic, not one of anger or fear, but one of peace and joy and love. Thank you so much for showing that to us and blessing us by showing how you precisely judge the world. I pray we go out of here and be lights in our community. In Jesus' name, amen.